All right. Uh, for John and Sophie, you were not with us last week, so uh, it's a, a bit of a catch up. But I actually repeated a few slides, which makes it easier uh, to contextualize things. So last week, our focus was primarily from a teaching, the teacher or the instructor perspective. This week, I want to angle it more from the learner or the learning experience perspective. Okay. Um, now, let me see. There we go. Now, um, so we want to look at how the uh, learners benefit. And there are four, four levels of impact. Uh, the lowest, I should say, is at the bottom. And we're just looking at how comfortable is the learner. Are they uh, happy? Very, very superficial, emotional type of connection. And as they move up, then we're looking at confidence. Are they able to carry out the task or whatever it is they're supposed to, the behavior they're supposed to adopt? Then if we move it up, have we extended their, uh, the breadth and the depth of their experience? Have we really increased their capacity to influence or to make slightly more complex decisions than before they took the class? And of course, at the very top, uh, have, you know, are they able to uh, create an impact that can be felt at the job, in the organization, it be it for missions for you, for the community, or even in the family? So depending on this uh, uh, intent, which level of impact are we hoping the uh, learner be able to achieve? Accordingly, we design our uh, interaction. Okay? So uh, we went through this slide last week, but I just wanted to reinforce the point here, uh, which is uh, the four steps, right? We start from um, unconscious incompetence, meaning I don't know that I don't know. Then I move to, oh, I realize that I don't know. Then I realize that, oh, actually I know now. And then I become an expert that I'm not even thinking of the fact that I, I know. So we are looking at, again, which level are we uh, uh, intervene, intervening in. If we are intervening at this level, then we're basically creating awareness. Before, I didn't know. I didn't even know that I didn't know. Now I create awareness so you know. So we take the example of COVID. Before, we didn't know. Now everybody's aware. Then if we go up to um, the fact that uh, we are now competent, as in everybody knows how to put on a face mask, hopefully. <laughs> and then we move up to we are all become such experts at uh, avoiding certain circumstance and being very sensitive to uh, uh, washing hands, you know, doing the very things of uh, hygiene becomes second nature, if you will. Okay, so yeah, I'm transformed, basically. Okay, so moving from, from uh, so the, 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 the statements in the purple boxes is basically, if I'm going to measure, what am I going to measure? Uh, and depending on the intent, what I'm going to measure, then those questions in the purple box is supposed to uh, guide us in the decision. And eventually, now that I've measured and I have the data, what am I going to do with the data? So technically, we should begin with that first. What am I going to do with the data? So what data should I collect? Okay. So today's uh, focus, we're not going to cover that because we really covered that in the last session. But I want to build on what we went through the last week, which is this uh, chart, which we have covered last week also. But I want to build on top of it because I think potentially it could have been a little bit uh, confusing. So I'm going to illustrate it now. So in the case of uh, data bits, right, before it even becomes information, uh, let's say myself, I might have heard somebody quote John 3.16 at some point. Uh, but it means nothing to me. No context whatsoever. So, but then somebody actually pointed me to read the verse. So it's become a form of information to me. An occasional and isolated relationship, no personal context for me. I just know that there is this verse, my friend who loves to quote it to me and pointed me to read that verse. Now, if I now then have a chance to discuss it with someone uh, about what this John 3.16 is about, so I'm given some more meaning, some more broader context, although there's no deep learning, it is now uh, classified as knowledge. Now, if I move it further and I start to meditate and start to see John 3.16 in real life, that's when we talk about greater knowledge, where we start to associate uh, John 3.16 with relationship as a concept uh, and true conditioning, which is um, 
positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement. Or for that matter, it could be uh, uh, other forms of reinforcement. Uh, now, if I take that further over a longer period of time, that becomes I'm fully uh, 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 gone through the whole baptismal process. I'm living John 3.16 now. And therefore, my mindset has changed and I can turn around and disciple people. So I thought if I use this as an illustration or make those four segments a little bit more chewable, I added in this part though. Noticeably, as we move towards the, um, or away from data bits into the more uh, passion-driven wisdom, it gets more social. Uh, you know, I can read, like I say, uh, uh, some flyer that says John 3.16. Nothing social about that. Somebody points me to read a verse. Nothing too social about that. But as we start moving towards the meditating and discussing and being able to disciple others, it starts to get more social. Okay? So if I build on this again now, I, I will share this in the context of one uh, passage in the Bible. And I'll ask you after this series, you can tell me which passage that is. Okay? So when dealing with data bits, it's really uh, equivalent to uh, me being present to read that information, but for the wrong reason, not relevant to me. Okay, now let's not uh, use the John 3.16 as a point, but maybe um, I'm attending some course and uh, I'm there not because I want to, I'm not there because I'm interested in the subject, I'm just there, but for the wrong reason. And my brain is all over the place, I'm focused on too many things and I'm not purposeful as a result. Hence, I get some initial awareness about that subject. But after some time, because of the fact that I'm not there for, for any focused reason, all this distraction starts to come in and i not paying attention. It is uh, the new thought uh, in what we talked about uh, planting of a thought last week, last week. This new thought will not plant. But after I walk away from the lesson, I will forget it. I want to take this uh, moment to use an illustration. Many years back, and I won't name the church, many years back after I uh, came back from the US, I was searching to go to a, a, a home church to go to. And I was attending this well-known church, Charismatic. Uh, but one Sunday after I left, I was feeling extremely high. And within 20 minutes of walking out of the church, I asked myself, okay, what can I apply for the next week? I still feel very high, but nothing came to mind. I wasn't able to draw any information that I could apply for the next week. So it could potentially fit in this scenario. Okay? Now, as we deal with information, okay, I may have initial enthusiasm. Uh, I, I think I fit. I think I'm there for uh, whatever I, I want to learn. But still not too focused, still not too purposeful. And after some time, I find that it's difficult to sustain my interest. Then I look at the opportunity cost. Mm, maybe I shouldn't be in this class. Um, maybe this, maybe that. Then my motivation drops and the total distraction sets in. Okay. Now with knowledge, uh, now we have a scenario of um, trials, right? As I, I develop the knowledge, trials could be, um, I'm finding it too difficult. Uh, I've got too many classmates who are smarter than me. Uh, then that causes me some doubt. So the doubt will choke the uh, application of that knowledge and I begin to have more and more negative self-talk. I'll say things like, maybe I'm not smart enough. Maybe this is not for me. Maybe this, maybe that, the emotional strings will start to come up. Or it could also be, I become so good at it, I become prideful. Uh, as I said, knowledge puffs up. So this is where the information actually doesn't really translate to application. Then now we move into, hey, something is planting into my uh, schema. And this uh, could be an anchored skill that I'm trying to pick up, or it could be some truth, right? In the context of Christian mission field, it could be some uh, truth that I'm picking up. And because of uh, a state of humble and teachable mindset, I'm now allowing this uh, knowledge to become a greater knowledge to, to uh, anchor into my uh, long-term memory. As you see, we are moving more away from short-term memory, working memory towards long-term memory, which is on the top. Now, if I'm in that mindset, um, typically discomfort is not a problem for me. Uh, I'm quite happy to uh, encounter discomfort 
because I see it as a fertilizer to get even more information and an opportunity to change. And finally, we hit the wisdom. So in this case, you see the plants are start to flourish. So this is like a equivalent to us forming habits and the habit eventually becoming culture and value in which we use it to shape our decisions. And we should treasure the learning also from failure as well as brokenness because we are reaching into the uh, uh, transformation uh, aspects of uh, learning. So we, failure and brokenness is a very uh, uh, big part of transformation. So we can get wiser, but yet still weak, uh, sorry, meek from life's chiseling. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, sorry, I had a work call just now. Ah, no worries. Okay, so now if you look at this, can somebody share with me which Bible passage this is illustrating? Just go ahead and turn on your mic and just share. You have the bird, you have the rocks, you have the thorns, and then you have the growing plant. Which Bible passage is this illustrating? Susan, I think you know, right? Susan? Okay. Because I am also watching time, I'll answer the question myself. This is the parable of the sower, right? When the seed falls on the ground the the first uh, example was the birds will come and eat up the seeds so they never got to plant or the seed falls into rocky uh, ground and well it starts to grow but the root never really went down and so eventually fiddle out and uh, the next one was uh, uh, the thorns will come and crowd out uh, even though the plant started to grow and finally, because of the fact that the um, uh, plant is uh, able to find good fertile soil, it was able to um, grow. Yeah. So I was trying to map for that reason uh, the uh, parable of the sower to that uh, chart. Okay. If no question, I will move on. You saw this last week. I'm just basically using this as a context. This was what we said about planting, right? Whenever we have a new thought, a new something, we want to plant it in our heads. So that was where uh, previously we were talking about whether the seed gets a chance to plant, the new learning gets a chance to plant into our thoughts. Okay? So if I take that now, and if you recall, uh, those four words uh, starting with A, awareness, articulating, associating, adoption, and anchoring, uh, it's part of the movement from short-term memory into long-term memory. So, if you notice also, it happens over time. But one very important part to the whole thing is brokenness. For us to, in the, in the Christian speak, for us to really get into a transformation in a specific area of our life, God often break us. He often used brokenness to lead us into that transformation. So if we look at this whole learning from a, a learner perspective, if we really want to have a deep skill, a deep experience, a deep transformation, we must be prepared to get broken and learn something, relook at everything from a whole new perspective and learn a new way of seeing things. Painful along the way. Okay, this next series of slides uh, just decided to do a very uh, surface uh, character study. Very, very surface on here. So this, this is uh, nothing uh, uh, solid here. Just, just trying to identify uh, the about 10 characters and their skills uh, and how that relates to uh, this, uh, uh, the things that God has led them to do. Okay? So you have, uh, in this case, Noah. Interesting, right? Noah never 
ha we understood that during that time there was never anything called rain. There's no concept of water bodies. So for him to suddenly build a boat, he has no precedent to learn from. So everything to him is new concept, new processes, even new chemicals using tar and all those things. So um, for him, therefore, it's um, uh, a heart of uh, being teachable, his attitude. He has to be teachable to learn all those things directly from God. And he had to trust God because there were a lot of people who were obviously uh, teasing him and he had to discount a lot of those uh, people's reaction. Okay, so the next person is, um, oops, what did I do? Jacob. So Jacob, we know he's got deep farming skills and husbandry skills where he has developed the experience with lambs and pastures and along the way he learned new skills like how to do uh, mix certain uh, spotted blemish lamb with others. So I believe it was his attitude of observation uh, and being shrewd to a certain extent and, and hardworking. So he used selective breeding in what we learned today, right? The term selective breeding is because of his deep expertise gained from his years of work experience using observation and skills derived from, I believe, unintended mistakes. Like the story of the Levi's jeans, the washout look actually came from a mistake. Okay. Uh, Joseph. His uh, skill set is in the area of leadership and governance skill. So we do know he's been given a gift of administration and he has the ability to interpret and analyze dreams and complex scenarios. Um, from an attitude perspective, he's a man of authority. He knows that God has given him that dream and he stepped into that role. And eventually, he became the uh, prime minister of uh, Egypt. So that authority uh, is an uh, important part of his role. Uh, he's visionary, he's forward-looking because he went through, right, one bad situation to another. Instead of groveling in his bad experience, he's always looking at what can I learn, how can I write through, believing and trusting that God is still going to bring him through. So he served diligently and accepted the role. He's not focused on his rights. This is not my right. I should be living a better life. He served unto God. And he used his new skills eventually to bless his supervisors at the jail cell, his customers, whoever his customers would be eventually would have been the, uh, the, the Pharaoh of Egypt. And as such, he's a good steward. We look at Moses. Moses has leadership and governance skills as well. And a lot of time he was uh, involved in problem solving and he often uh, used values because he was such a close relationship with God. He used his values uh, driven uh, to uh, values driven uh, approach to problem solving. He's obviously involved in counseling. There's enough scriptures to talk about that. He's also uh, got the skills of governance. Now, granted, he may not have wanted it at the beginning, but along the way, because in obedience to God, he eventually also uh, picked up all the skills. He's pastoral and he's tenacious as well. Um, in the uh, role of him presenting uh, the uh, request before Pharaoh, I do believe he had no choice in that sense. He was given the assignment and in faith he stepped out. In some ways, he may have made certain mistakes, but he just went ahead and did it first. And from the mistakes, trusting God, he learned. He learned a lot more things. So his obedience to God's direction even though the conditions are discouraging, is what makes him a excellent leader in an excellent governance. Now, this name, I don't know how many of you are familiar with them. It's in Exodus 31. I like this because clearly in there, the scripture talks about them being chosen by God, filled with the wisdom by God, of God, gifted by the ability uh, and expertise in all kinds of craft. Uh, you can read it for yourself there. So, God used them to, uh, uh, not only use them, God actually appointed them, gifted them, and then used them uh, to build the uh, various articles for the tabernacle. Joshua. We also know from Joshua, he's a military, military leader. Uh, he does a lot of strategic planning and he communicates well too. So those are some of the skill sets he has. And then uh, in terms of attitude, you could see he's visionary. He's very clear-minded, obviously faith-centric. He's courageous, focused, and has grit and learned from his mentor Moses. Now, 
you might be asking as to why I'm going through this series. Because these are all about skills, right? It's about building up skills. So we talked about earlier this series, this uh, webinar too, is to focus on learning experience, on the learner. So a lot of them went through learning experiences in, not, uh, uh, in terms of where they got to be, where they are. They went through learning experiences. Same for Daniel. He went through learning experiences as well. Uh, not the least of which was being in the lion's den and being accused. Uh, so uh, I won't read through this because this is anyway uh, recorded, but essentially he has a strong uh, personal conviction and he's very teachable. Okay. Nehemiah. Nehemiah has a lot of stuff. So I will just uh, quickly go through it. He's a leader. He communicates, he negotiates, he's good at public speaking. Definitely gifted for admin leadership, governance and, and so on. Uh, one of which is crisis management. He's a change agent. He's a rebuilder. In terms of his attitude, he is uh, methodical, he's reliable, and he's also uh, willing to be vulnerable, to take on the leadership even though uh, there were a lot of opposition. And we're going to New Testament, we're two characters in two New Testament, we're Peter and we're Paul. And Peter is uh, a very interesting, I mean, he, I call products because he was selling fish, right? So that's his experience. With products, with services, being a fisherman, mending nets, and so on. But eventually, he was a leader. He became a teacher and an orator. So I want to add to it the attitude of uh, being teachable because this picture, this photograph here shows clearly that um, at that time, Jesus asked, him to cast, asked Peter to cast the net. And Peter said, I spent all night fishing and I caught nothing. But since you asked me to, I will. And as such, their nets were uh, filled beyond uh, capacity. So sometimes, no matter how skilled we are, we need to be teachable, and so that we need, uh, we have that um, uh, uh, obedience to a instruction given by God, which may be counter to our um, understanding uh, against our what our skills tells us. Uh, or, or our experience tells us. And Paul, the guy who wrote all the epistles, uh, he's obviously a leader, he teaches, and he's got uh, research skills as well. He, uh, he's a leader, uh, sorry, a, a leather expert. He obviously uses uh, leather as uh, tent making. That's why the term tent making came into play. But other parts of uh, Paul uh, came into the fact that his attitude is obviously also reflected by the fact that he is a man of authority and he led by example, an intellectual guy, very principle driven, genuine and reliable. And he pursues excellence for Christ. Also tenacious and teachable. Teachable because he will con completely transform from Saul to Paul. Okay, so I finished this series of the examples of um, uh, the various folks in the Bible. There are many more, right? But I only shortlisted this 10 to talk about skills and attitude. And really, the Bible is a very good source of uh, understanding skills, understanding uh, learning, understanding how without God, whatever we learn, uh, the application is missing. Really, we need uh, the process, right? So I'm actually uh, leaving the screen blank for a while. So learning requires more than just the awareness. So I'm thinking of this example of a, uh, a friend's nephew. Apparently, he is so interested in fishing that he's read every magazine, watched every video on uh, fishing. So he can talk about fishing like a pro. But when I ask, has, has he ever gone out to actually do fishing? His answer was no. So here's a very interesting example that we can learn head knowledge. We can talk like a pro. But if we have not actually gone through the experience of, then can we say we are knowledgeable? Can we say we have learned about fishing? So back to that chart, right? What is learning? What are we measuring? Are we measuring just merely at the level of them being able to uh, talk or we're talking about them being able to influence so 
there are many different ways of uh, measuring and the word learn, I'll come to that. What does learn mean uh, uh, at the, the tail end of this presentation? So for now, uh, anyone has any questions, any clarification before I continue on? Because we, we are not having this connecting point, so I, I don't want to lose connection with you guys. Uh, Anything at all, please uh, uh, go ahead and let me know. Okay, if not, I'll continue. This series of pictures, uh, FYI, I'm not reading the chat. Huh? So in case you're typing into the chat, I'm not reading that. So this series of pictures is just a collection of uh, Jesus as the teacher. So he's seen uh, teaching at the coast. He's seen teaching in the mountainsides. He's seen teaching at the... Uh, uh, Jewish temple. He's seen teaching uh, from the boat out in the sea. He's seen also teaching from the um, uh, what do you call that thing? The Last Supper when he's uh, together with his disciples. Okay, and he's seen teaching when he's using children as well. And he's often also learning when he's by himself talking to the Father. So, Jesus is a teacher. Here are a few series of words that you will find, some of which you will identify with what we said earlier, the authority. He spoke, obviously, from a position of authority, that which I hear from my father, I speak. He has memorable sayings. It is I, do not fear. I, I can quote a whole lot more. Uh, this is not a Bible study, so I, I won't go down that line. He tells stories. The story of the Good Samaritan. Okay. Uh, he used visual illustration, which is he asked, uh, was it Peter or one of the disciples uh, to take a coin? So what's, on, what's the illustration or what's the visual on the coin? And then he illustrated about tax paying. He created experiences for, for his uh, uh, learners. So um, the loaves, uh, five loaves and uh, two fishes is an experience that he had created. Uh, Lazarus coming out from the Great. It's also an experience he had created for them. He asks questions. Sometimes he answers by asking questions uh, to the Pharisees, right? If you don't answer, then I won't answer you as well. Um, clearly, he uses repetition because repetition is a very important part of learning, right? We have to move from short-term memory into long-term memory. We have to rehearse. So, discipling is not a one-time event. Discipling is a process which we then have to go through the whole awareness into the information, into the knowledge, into the wisdom, into the whole brokenness, all that will repeat the same message of God. That message could be, I will never abandon you. And my love for you is forever. Any range of those. We all could quote examples of how the message has been repeated. So how do we apply this even in our design of learning for the people we train? So how do, the, the, the response to that is, how can I speak from an authority perspective? So I have uh, experienced, and some of you might have also, that a lot of trainers out there, it's just looking at training as a cash cow. Yeah, so you know, I just go and read up some books and I can deliver the training. And this is a real example, it happens to be a a Caucasian foreigner, he um, had an opportunity invited to speak on e-learning. So he went and read up all the books, the whatever he could read up, and then he delivered a talk on e-learning. Has he de designed or delivered e-learning? No. So I believe that whoever, or whichever one of us deliver training, we must come from a authority. And what does authority mean? Uh, I quote myself, I have the calling and I have the years of exposure and I have the gifting. So when I do the training, I'm actually training from a position of having been exposed to the field 40 plus years. And I'm speaking from an authority perspective. Now I tell stories because, and I quoted a few stories just to illustrate the point because over the years, I have a lot of war stories I can uh, pull out from my uh, memory to share. Uh, I ask people questions to reflect. Today, because of time, I don't do that. I use visual illustrations, as you can see in my slides. Uh, in a actual class, uh, online or otherwise, uh, that I teach, I usually create experiences. So you, they call experiential learning. 
and um, shocked people. Jesus do use a situation to shock people. So Matthew uh, chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount, is actually an upside down kingdom. He uses that to shock people. When he also was in the temple and correcting the bad behaviors, that was also quite a, 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 a thing that shocked people. So we can also create experiences that shock people. It has to be carefully curated, obviously. Uh, the idea of shocking people is to shake them out of their uh, assumptions. Okay? Last but not least, Jesus always practiced what he preached, which means for us as trainers, we must always walk the talk. We cannot say one thing in the teaching and then we do something else after that. So case in point, if I'm talking about learning, design, if my delivery is super boring and it's putting all of you to sleep, then I have failed in uh, modeling the behavior, so to speak. And I'm mindful of the fact that I'm doing all the talking, which I prefer not to. Okay, this uh, set of slides is basically, again, to qualify uh, the nature of uh, learning that you want a user to go through. Is it a case of uh, just uh, getting uh, information? Then the focus is about clarifying, finding definitions, uh, you know, for planning purposes, for, you know, quick communication, or even for entertainment and uh, transaction purposes. So in which case, this type of um, communication or learning, I actually don't call it learning, it's more information, lends itself very well for mobile because there's no real deep learning, it's just a lot of transactional type of information. Whereas if you are really talking about a, a stronger form of learning, a deeper form of learning, where you uh, want to build employability skills, where you talk about things like critical thinking, good communication, negotiation skills, uh, processes, technology, and then the team collaboration, then mobile is not the best platform. You really need a combination of classroom and uh, uh, a laptop more than a mobile. So that you can read the rest of the information there. And lastly, we want to focus on performance, which really this picture, you will, you will see if I click on it, it moves. Okay. Oops, sorry. I actually already got it moving. Huh? Let me see if I can. Did it move just now? So uh, this, these are some snapshots I took at the Kalang Wave Mall of various people attempting to do rock climbing. If you look at this young person, uh, I did it very fast, but you can actually go there and watch for yourself. It's decision making all along the way. Should I reach out to the left or should I reach out to the right? Should I step on the left or should I step on the left? Whichever left or right. And so should I take the larger uh, Handhold, or should I take the smaller? Or should I take this angle or that angle? All this is about decision making. And last week I had talked about decision making. So the, the person has to process the implication. Now, if I stretch my leg too much, I get tired. If my arm cannot reach, I might fall down. So these are all performance related type of learning. So we see at the top, uh, there's coaching, mentoring, and uh, uh, focusing on a permanent change in behavior. That means to be able to actually do rock climbing is a permanent change in behavior. So my bringing this up is to show you, you cannot use pure information, mobile driven information to teach a person how to do rock climbing. Uh, after 10 sessions of mobile reading, this person will definitely not be able to do rock climbing. The best way to learn rock climbing is to go there and do it with the harness, fall down, unable to complete, try again, and that is, to me, the best way to learn, which is performance, okay? So, which is what I have in this repeated slide from last week. At the end of the day, we need to link it to performance, and performance is all about making decisions, okay? And we did do this slide, so I'll gloss over this in the interest of time, uh, about what exactly are we gonna measure. Uh, okay, so we're moving into the reflection moment now. Um, just a few uh, quotations here and there for um, uh, us to reflect. I really hope, because we, we still have sufficient time, that you guys uh, can do a uh, op open up your mic and have a sharing session on this. 
Okay. So what's the definition of learning? I took the liberty to look at a couple of Chinese characters. I'm definitely not strong in Chinese, but uh, whatever that I could do the research. Ke, which is either it's a class, a lesson, or a subject. When um, separated into its component parts, has the uh, element of word, speech, to be able to speak and say something. So learning cannot happen without words, speech, uh, declaration, uh, communication. And part of that learning is also uh, the fruit, the end state, the, the result. Uh, nut and fruit is basically the core, as in the, uh, the harvesting, if you will. The other word that I went to look for is C, which is to practice. Um, yen C, right? To practice. So the word for practice, as I researched it, is two, pop, two components. One is the wings of the bird on the upper section, and the lower section is the, the some people say it's the variant of self. Um, the uh, person went on to explain that the uh, pictograph is saying something to the effect like a young chick fluttering its wings on its own to practice flying. So if you look, look at this type of learning, really there's no need to read a manual and step one, step two, so on. But really use the resources that God has already given us. Use the talents, the gift that God has already given us. It's in using, it's in trying, as in performing, learning, what work, what doesn't work, uh, that we truly develop the skills and the wisdom. So on the um, definition from a dictionary perspective, learning is change. And how would it be? It has to be change in the thinking, change in our feeling, change in our behavior, which involves our mind, our emotion and our will. Okay, and it always starts with the feeling level, our emotion. So if we are able to address the fact and accept the fact that we have bias at the beginning, uh, at the fact uh, we, we move away from, I don't know that I don't know. So I now am at the stage where I know that I don't know. So I'm being challenged to accept that I don't know. So I should correct what my previous views are. Okay, And... The attitude accordingly would be that of uh, being teachable, being able, uh, being willing to embrace new thoughts. But the real permanent change in the behavior is when we exercise our will. That's why the will is a very important part in our walk with God and in learning as well. Uh, and you know, last time I talked about weight loss. No one can truly do a weight loss, weight loss without exercising the will. No one can truly transform without exercising the will to change. So I want to quote from this um, uh, author, Howard Hendricks, uh, a Christian brother who since passed away, I think 2012. And he wrote this book called The Seven Laws of Teaching. And the acronym for teacher on the left side is those seven laws. So tip. T for teacher, E for education, A for activity involved, C for communication and building bridges, H for the heart, E for encouragement, and R for readiness. The book is very elaborate, but I'm only going to quote for this one in particular for education. Uh, so to truly help a learner, we need to design activities that direct them into self-learning. We stimulate them into self-learning, create that Think about thinking, learn about learning, uh, so that they eventually develop the principles. So like for every young child, we say, every time they run into some kind of an issue or problem, don't stop it for them immediately. Ask them the question, what do you think God is saying? How do you think God would want you to uh, uh, address this? Or pray to God and ask for help. So when we encourage them to develop that kind of early behaviors, when parents are not around, the child will know to call out to God for help. And that's the most ideal form of learning, even in the workplace. Uh, you, we don't want a lear learner or a staff to constantly go back to the supervisor for help. We want them to develop a certain level of independence, but not unilateral 
uh, decision making. So that that kind of learning is a very critical part of uh, being um, uh, it survive uh, a, a treasured uh, staff in today's workforce. So essentially, true education is a series of teachable moments. So not only is the person should be teachable, but the way we craft that learning experience should translate to teachable moments. And how we, again, through our passion, through our design of the learning experiences, through our walking the talk, we must infect the learner. If we don't infect, and that is in discipling as well, right? We must infect the person to see the treasure of working with Christ. Then we have this bit that um, the tension um, we want to create must not be too little. If there's no tension, too much comfort, apathy will set in, the person will not walk away learning anything. But if we put in too much of a, a tension point, it will lead to frustration, stress, and anxiety, which is counterproductive. But the most important point I want to share here really is what this uh, Howard Hendricks said is for true learning to happen, we need to disturb the equilibrium, which is what I said much earlier on, brokenness. That's why even when we deliver training or when we want to create some learning experience, do not think that the best thing you should do is to create a very comfortable position, a comfortable room, everything superbly beautiful. You know. There's a lot of people who think that that's the best environment for learning. Now, if it's for awareness level, maybe. But if you want to go into the deep learning, the long-term memory stuff and a real transformation type of learning, then disturb the equilibrium. Sitting down is the worst because eventually our slouch uh, become a sort of a, a potato on the couch kind of thing. And my, my whole body mechanism is not on uh, this edge of what's going to happen next. So the design of how to disturb the equilibrium obviously cannot be too weak or too strong, as uh, we just moment said. Okay? So uh, two more quotes and then we'll open for discussion. Uh, this guy, John Milton, said, uh, true teaching is not about giving knowledge, but that which stimulates the learner or the pupil to gain it. I like this particular last bit. One might say, he who teaches best, sorry, he who teaches best, so he, he teaches best who teaches least. So basically, the, the, the role of a teacher as we know it today is no longer the person who holds all the knowledge, but the person who facilitates the learning of the uh, learners that we are supposed to influence. Okay. One more from him. Uh, ideas must be rethought, experienced, or re-experienced. As opposed to, I'm tr uh, treating the knowledge as a form of uh, material substance and I said pluck it from my head and I put it into your head it doesn't happen that way it has to be experienced reflected upon and re-experienced and if you remember last week we went through this diagram so true learning should really have this whole reflecting considering deciding reflecting experiencing you know after I conclude I might also reconsider so if we just merely like what I'm doing right now, blah, 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 it really isn't the best way to deliver uh, training. Okay. So that's the last of my slides. Uh, shall we open it up for discussion? 45 minutes I've taken, I think, around. Thanks, uh, uh, Paul Moy. Um, one thing I wanted to uh, ask you, uh, um, so, in your observation uh, in the church, uh, um, um, you know, like, uh, say, you know, ch children's Sunday school, right? Mm -hmm. um, are we today, right, uh, most churches, you know, they basically buy a curriculum from somewhere, most of it from the States, right? And then you run through the curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, what what is your observation? Is that you know effective? I mean, you know, kind of learning, 
um, and all that? Okay, I cannot speak for all churches, so I will generalize. Mm -hmm. um, those who follow a text, okay, kids, we're supposed to do this. Let's do this. We are supposed to do that. Now let's color. And they're just merely following the uh, cryptid uh, uh, items. I would consider that as ineffective because to be a good um, learning experience, I need to know the child. I need to sense that group, be it one or two or 10 kids with me, what are they struggling with? And I need to look at, and one of the things I didn't get to elaborate uh, because of time, Jesus, when he uh, approached people, he always starts from their context. The woman at the well, the rich young ruler, and he always speak into their life most relevant to their need at that moment. So maybe, let's say, for example, uh, kids are coming back to Sunday school. So let's take the example of COVID-19. So kids, what did you learn in this? You know, And then take that experience and then now map it back to uh, what the lesson uh, might say and make it real and relevant as well as get each of the kids to demonstrate. That's still at a very, maybe awareness and knowledge level, but you really want to impact at a deeper level. I quote an experience, an observation rather, that I saw in uh, YWAM in Kona, Hawaii. Um, I was invited by a friend and when I sat in for, uh, they allow guests to sit in for four days. And uh, so during one of the uh, uh, group gatherings, uh, which included the uh, parents with young children, what really caught my attention, which I have not seen much in the uh, churches at large, but it was there with the YWAM King's Kid program. They taught the kids at two years old, as young as two years old, and I think there might be younger ones, to practice prophesying. Now, what's prophecy? Quoting from the Bible. So they taught the kids to go up to any adults and, and, and sort of um, be led by the Spirit to utter a verse from the Bible for that person. Seriously, you can never learn that from a textbook. It's the experience of quoting that scripture and walking up to whoever you feel is the God asking you to talk to. That experience is amazing. That to me, the kid will eventually learn how to listen to God at even two years old. And they're like speaking verses to uh, comfort, encourage, or declare uh, blessings unto people. So there's a big difference from just quoting from a pre-scripted um, training material. Yeah, thanks. I mean, my observation is that, I mean, I met, uh, I've been meeting a lot, right, of Mm. kids who goes through whatever you know 15 years of Sunday school and mm. when they reach their teenage years um, mm. or older mm. there's quite a big disconnect I mean they, they yes. can still uh, you know memorize and you know quote a, a, a scripture or Bible story mm. but um, when they are living in you know with their classmates or whatever yeah. They can be living a double life. <laughs> yes. I mean, I was working with a colleague who shared with me that uh, yeah. she was horrified to learn that her daughter who's been going through Sunday school and, you know, yeah. they thought was okay uh, until, you know, uh, they discovered that she was going to, uh, she told the mom, uh, she was going through, I think it's JC days, she was going yeah. to study, you know, uh, overnight uh, or over the yeah. weekend with her friends. Yeah. But mm -hmm. actually what she was doing is that, uh, you know, they were uh, going discotheque, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, packing, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, away from the mother, uh, a different mm -hmm. set of clothes and living mm -hmm. ahead of friend's space because, you know, she doesn't want the mom to know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, you know, sometimes there's a, you know, a real disconnect when a child mm -hmm. internalize uh, uh, yep. the learning. Yeah. Uh, that's a very good example and I, I, I hesitate but it's painful to say 
a lot of times uh, Christian parents just take their children to church and then they leave the church to take care of their children. But once they go home, that experience is not there. Uh, that's why it really, church isn't the place where the child becomes a Christian. Home is the place where the child becomes a Christian. Again, I cite another example. Uh, I, my jaw dropped when I heard this, but it's amazing, truly. Um, I don't know the person, it's reported to me. Apparently, there's this one lady who uh, was breastfeeding her kid. And uh, she had conditioned the kid so much so that whenever the kid cries for feeding, she said, let's pray. The wailing will just completely stop and the kid will keep, be quiet. Mom will pray. Then when mom says amen, the kid will start crying again. That, that conditioning happens at home because it's the at least 8 to 10 hours the kid is watching the parents. So back to what I showed in the one slide, right? It's the conditioning plus the values. When you have the values and the conditioning, which is uh, reinforce, positive reinforcement or versus negative reinforcement, that becomes value, culture, lifestyle from young. Why can't we teach our one-year-old the, 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 at least the behavioral posture of praying? We have observed that whenever the church prays, the kids are running around, they're talking. They don't know what it is to be reverentially quiet, at least during prayer. They don't know what it is to worship God because they just are there. Parents don't bring in that deeper understanding of posturing before God. And, and to me, it's no surprise. No? We're seeing that with a lot of uh, second generation believers grow up in Christian families, but eventually all walked away from Christian faith. Just they can't identify. It's just a bunch of do's and don'ts. On Sunday, I just drag over there. Um, but my friends don't believe in it and I don't want to lose my friends. So, and one of the things that we don't get our youth to discuss a lot is real issues. They have classmates who are very em, uh, uh, empath empathetic towards issues. If Christians take a very hard stance and you guys are very judgmental. Uh, so our kids are not able to discern like, am I being judgmental? Or oh, maybe I should be more accepting because after all, I don't want to be seen to be a judgmental person. So they are not taught how to process all these things. And they're in the real world, a real and harsh world. Yeah, thanks. I better leave uh, others in case they have questions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cheryl, um, not to put the spotlight on you, but uh, I'm just curious, right? Maybe you can also share um, if you are in a position to share because I know some of you are having dinner and all that stuff. Uh, but, uh, you know, what, uh, what motivates you, right, to want to, uh, you know, learn more about learning, I guess, you know? I mean, tell us a bit about your background. Are you a teacher, you know, and all that? Oh, you, you said you had a work call, so, you know, what uh, what area, right? Uh, I guess it cannot be a teacher uh, if it's working so late. Oh, maybe you are. <laughs> maybe possible. <laughs> <laughs> if you if it's convenient for you, for you to share, Cheryl. Okay. Uh, hi, I am, uh, I'm not a teacher, but my parents were teachers. Uh, so after having to mark their papers when I was a kid, I decided that's not really a line I want to go into. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, I mean, I guess we are all learning and in our work, we, we have to meet people and I guess in a way also train and teach others who are younger, who are newer in the company. Mm. So I'm a TV producer. Oh. Um, and uh, yeah, just now I was trying to find a profile quite desperately. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I, I mean, I, I missed quite a fair bit, but I think what was helpful was uh, Jesus' example, which was uh, interesting, and also the people, the various characters in the Bible that you mentioned, their skills. Mm. Um, I wish I had more time to digest it, lah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah it's a very short session. Uh, really, there's a lot of meat that, that I wish I could go through and have the more experiential version of this. Uh, mm. maybe someday. Yeah, maybe. Can, can I ask you a question since you're a TV producer and we are talking about learning? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, um, I, found, I find that the Koreans has mastered the art, right? <laughs> of teaching through their K-drama. I mean, they're exporting <gasps> their culture because of the popularity yeah. of K-drama, you right. know, their cosmetics, kimchi. I mean, you know, how many of us eat, eat kimchi in the past, right? Um, yeah. So what, what is, you know, as a TV producer or even uh, Pomoy, right, you can comment. I mean, I, I think they are brilliant uh, teachers in that sense, right? I mean, mm -hmm. with so great a following, everyone anticipating, you know, the next episode. Um, yeah. Can you comment on that? I mean, why, why are they uh, so addictive to so many people? What, what is that element, right? To me, it's, if we can learn that, right, then uh, we can also be making <laughs> our, uh, yeah, teaching <laughs> uh, our, our dramas more addictive. Any comments? The, the Koreans are really a master. I mean, I think their budgets are very big. Each episode, I don't know, maybe one million. Oh. They've got also good-looking uh, stars. <laughs> and I think the plot, the storylines are mm. very interesting. So mm. it's a whole combination of everything. Mm. La, that's the mm. makeup industry and all that. Mm. Uh, mm. Yeah, and how they make each episode. It will end on a cliffhanger so they will continue <laughs> and like binge watch the whole weekend. Yes. Mm. Totally. Yeah. Mm. We have much to learn. Yeah, my I, prayer I, I, is I, that mm. we Christians, right, who is in that uh, world, uh, mm. uh, can help us tell, you know, our Christian story. Uh, even, you know, just as interesting and powerful. <laughs> mm. Mm. I, I add to, uh, actually resonates with uh, Cheryl. Two things that I find very powerful. The script writing is amazing. Mm. Okay, granted, there are all the other elements, but it's the script that's most amazing. And the script, I believe, it's very well, is, uh, well referenced from real scenarios. Mm. It gets a bit too fluffy. <laughs> you know, like the Taiwanese type, right? Uh, why mm. we give up watching them? Uh, so that's one. So their, their script is really so real that you feel like yourself entering the space with them. Mm. Mm. The second one is editing. It's their mm. editing power of knowing how to stop at that right moment. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, some of us um, in, the, in, the, in the Singapore kind of scenario, we, we tend to be very predictive yeah. we just do things nicely very predictive when things are predictive we can tell the next step our mm. brains all over the place already but mm. when you are on the cliffhanger as Cheryl say you're like what's next what's next oh <laughs> you know? so it's the element of surprise the element of shock uh, and we can actually uh, I can share some of the notes uh, which I obviously did not put a lot on screen uh, mm. on the approach that Jesus has taken uh, mm. I'm so glad there are materials out there. And if we just follow Jesus' uh, uh, example, we will have a lot of uh, tricks up our sleeve also. Hmm. I haven't quite investigated whether there are many Christian productions, uh, but from the few I've seen, they have not been very strong. Yes. Yeah. In terms of storyline, in terms of the acting as well, some... Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. So I, I don't know. I... Yeah, Maybe I'm praying. I'm praying for <laughs> one that you know will will right take the world you know by storm mm. right you know, and will have a following, uh, um, mm. and like never before. Let's pray. Let's pray because it's so powerful, isn't it? I mean, yeah. uh, you know, you go refugee camps. I tell you, uh, I, you know, I work with mm. uh, a missionary right in in northern mm -hmm. Iraq. I tell you, you know, you'll be shocked. You know, they're watching Korean dramas. You know. <laughs> yeah. and, wow. and, 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 and you know what I asked right? I said do they have subtitles in Arabic or whatever right the language no yeah. you know what I mean because no, not yeah. yet be able to translate right someone who wow. understand Korean to whatever <laughs> the local dialect they hmm. go by the expressions you wow. know <laughs> and all that huh? and they still wow. like it right you know so it's quite amazing that's amazing yeah, yeah. that's yeah. great 
Yeah, hopefully. Um, I just yeah, I just thought of something. My church has a counseling. I'm uh, from Wesley. My church has a counseling ministry, mm. and from time to time, um, my counselors will actually come out with a workshop called "What I Learned About Suicide or Depression mm. or mm. Family, Whatever mm. I mm. Learned in the Movies." Mm. So these oh. um, counselors will actually take give us let us watch certain uh, excerpts mm. of movies to illustrate points, and I think there mm. is value in that because. I mean, yes. there are a lot of shows that have promote good values as well, good stories mm. that we can borrow and use as a lesson, a way to um, leapfrog into what we want to say like, or want to yes. share mm. our, our own yes. points of view. So yes. that could be yeah. it if we can't even can't produce them ourselves. Yeah. 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 True. Resources are there, but uh, I guess I hear Su Chen's heart is, uh, mm. I don't think we, we lack the talent. I think it's just we lack the budget and we lack the, the drive. To pull the, yeah. the thing together. The talents are there, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, but actually, interestingly, I think God is doing something uh, in the media space. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. The last two months in particular, uh, I mean, I bump uh, into people who are in your line. Uh, mm-hmm. Cheryl, you know, like, uh, I don't know where you know, Sherman Ng, uh, he's uh, uh, a producer, you know, and he has a theater, I mean, a movie theater uh, in Capital, I think, hours. Mm-hmm. Sherman mm. Ng, you know, uh, what, um, salt, uh, what, light media. Salt and light? Yeah. Uh, okay. I think it's not salt and light, it's something uh, media, uh, light media. Salt media, or, I think. Uh, salt, salt media, media, salt media. So, mm-hmm. you know, he's, he's trying to bring, right, the, the kind of content uh, mm. um, that will really make people think. Uh, I, mean, I mean, it's not mm. very overtly Christian, you know. Mm. And the other person that I bump into is from MediaCorp, right? Keith, um, uh, Keith, what? Uh, Keith Tan, if I'm not wrong, right? He is, um, uh, in fact, he conducted one class on podcasting. You know, he's uh, like trying to help Christian uh, also go uh, audio, right? Because, you know, it's data light and some places, uh, you just mm. can't show video, right? You know, but a person mm. can be listening and driving yep. and running, right? So he was quite passionate and, and so I was very thankful that we have people in this space, right? That, uh, That's great. Just use every means possible. Mm. Uh, it's neutral, right? I mean, you know, there's nothing yep. evil about podcasting, right? But no, the no. content and if, mm. if many of us can start putting uh, uh, powerful content um, mm. and I think it will go very far and that's our mm. prayer, yeah. That's great. Mm. Yeah, great to 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 uh, hear that you're in that space and not a teacher. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, we do need people. We do need people in the media industry who yes. holds the light for God. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Anyone else have any uh, comments? We didn't get to know John. Maybe John can introduce himself a bit. The recording could probably stop. We we'll just chat. Yeah. Okay. I joined Midway, so uh, <laughs> we saw some of the, the slides that you show talking yeah. about learning. But I think in our culture in Singapore or in Asian country, there is the least focus on role learning. That means you just you know, transmit knowledge, mm. learn from one another. Mm. And uh, in a certain sense, uh, it's quite sad that uh, you know, we are not so innovative. As you say, we don't uh, take the process as part of growing up. Mm. We just know the knowledge part. Mm. So the process and the outcome part mm. is uh, not really being focused. Mm. And uh, we don't see failure as part of growing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, I hope that in the future, you know, as our, our society progress, then... Uh, as people like you all shared more to the society, people become aware of the, the need to learn actively. You know? mm. That yeah. uh, knowledge is just one aspect of learning. Right. Absolutely. The practice part, the experience part, the transformation part is also ultimately the thing that matters. Mm. See, if, if you look at Asia, right? <clears throat> China, mm. well, let's not name China first. India, Thailand, uh, these are the probably only two our name now. They are slightly different. While grades are important, by virtue of sure survival, 
the Indians are out there learning from the street, learning, uh, just purely taking up internship like crazy. A lot of students are taking two, three internships at the same time. And they just learn. Uh, I'm actually interviewing some, that's why I know this. They're saying they can never learn those things from their school. What the school teach them is obsolete by the time they graduate. So they mm. just want to go out there and do projects. So they are learning more by actually doing. And if you look at all the decision making in India, in the middle of chaos, there is some process. So it's them learning how to get around all this difficult. There's so much limitation, so many challenges that they develop this creativity. And this ability to move around barriers and whatever that you see a lot of world leaders uh, in terms of businesses are more and more helmed by brilliant uh, Indians. Um, Thailand has also got a low element of that. China is well split. There are the scholars and then there are the ones who are the street fighters, if you will. Singapore, unfortunately, has always pushed this whole uh, head knowledge, head knowledge aspects. That's why we are the one of the few nations, uh, this is not said by me, but many in my cohorts all say the same thing. If you look at the top uh, business owners or CEOs, almost all countries, they reserve and pre preserve that space for their natives. Only Singapore, we keep putting foreigners there because mm -hmm. it's true, our own people cannot take the helm. Why? Because our own people are all follow procedure, very transactional, quai quai and all those things. They don't know what it is to have lateral thinking. And it's our school systems that produce limitations like that. Mm. Uh, and yes, I really hope that it's not that ability issue, it's the conditioning issue. The less we condition people to have one way of thinking, the better our businesses can survive. Yeah. I think when we have so well uh, a governed uh, country, mm. right, you know, mm. uh, you, you know, and it works for a while, right? It works in a very safe, predictable world. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, you have like a whole machinery all geared, you know, uh, mm -hmm. everyone behaving correctly, right? You, you do mm. this or you, you know, you pick up accountancy or mm -hmm. law or whatever, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and then we try to balance the numbers and everything and mm -hmm. we will tell you what is needed for mm -hmm. our country. But in, in, in the future or the, in the state we now is, right, mm -hmm. and living through, is very unpredictable. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why uh, we need to shift. I mean, the Koreans mm -hmm. actually, thankfully, through their painful history, you know, through mm -hmm. whatever they've been through, uh, dictatorship and bad government came out of it uh, and produced companies that are world class. Mm. I mean, their, mm. their cosmetics are starting to be there and, mm. and, you know, and many other things. So there's something that they are doing that's uh, quite uh, different, right? You know, mm -hmm. uh, they can think out of the box. In Singapore, mm. we are unfortunately not there yet. Hopefully, right, we will change fast enough uh, mm. because we are small. Uh, so hopefully we will allow for you know that uh, left fielder, the out of box person, mm. <laughs> rather mm. than you know uh, don't uh, encourage it or you know uh, mm. uh, throw them into prison. I guess. <laughs> mm. Actually, that, since you mentioned that, I I just this thought came to mind to contrast Japan with South Korea. Mm. Japan had because of their own experience. <clears throat> created a lot of legislatures that restrain mm. and homogenize and uh, focus on hard work, hard work. And they've lost a lot of their shine. Mm. Whereas, like you say, Korea, out of their own experience, they came up with be innovative, mm. be, you know, uh, go out there and take risks. Uh, so you see the two nations gone, both from hardship but in different directions. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Okay, I think we better uh, round up, mm. right? I mean, mm. we kind of started late too, but uh, mm. I want to once again thank uh, Bo Mai for sharing with us and, you know, giving us your experience, your insights. Uh, you know, I think as the rest of us uh, uh, view the video, you know, there's quite a number who requested for it. Hopefully, day two uh, will pick up, uh, you know, mm. uh, some different thinking uh, that's, I think, really needed, especially in the churches. 
in terms of learning and how we teach uh, and all that. Okay, Ken. Mm-hmm. So um, till then, I guess we can uh, close, and then you guys can go and maybe finish up your dinner for some of you, <laughs> <laughs> or have a good rest. Right for me, it's so at one thirty a.m. Yeah, you need to sleep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, New Zealand. In case uh, I think the rest, no, except uh, Cheryl and your friend Susan. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we'll okay. we'll uh, connect again, maybe in some other ways. I'm sure you know God has mm-hmm. amazing ways to put His mm-hmm. people to work together. Okay. Yep. And I appreciate uh, any feedback whatsoever, uh, so that I know uh, the, you know it works or doesn't work and what I share. Okay. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good night. Good night. Bye bye. Bye. bye.